if you're not driving, close your eyes. What do you picture when you imagine the perfect home? Is it top of the line appliances or a family laughing together around a dinner table? Do you see lit candles and smell fresh chocolate chip cookies? I love fantasizing about what I want my future home to be like as a wife and mother, but is homemaking something anyone can do, or is it an art form? Is it possible that through the way we as women manage our homes and families, we can bring glory to God? Why does culture try to understate the importance of intentionality in our homes as women? Some of you might be new wives or new moms and you're homemaking with loved ones in mind for the first time. Whether you have a husband and kids live in a dorm or maybe you're like me and you have the chance to make a home for just you. And maybe you're decorating for the holidays. You're wanting to establish a safe haven for yourself year-round. This episode is for you. Today's guest is an expert at making what she calls a life-giving home. Doesn't that sound awesome? She's one of my heroes and biggest mentors. Even though she doesn't know it yet, she is going to. She will share what a life-giving home looks like, what home means even in the midst of moves and change in life's craziness. You're going to feel ready to embrace Race femininity, be encouraged to take control of making your house a home and in the mood to brew yourself a pot of tea. So get your teacups ready and help me welcome to the spillover, author and host of the podcast at Home with Sally, Sally Clarkson. Sally, you've written so many amazing books about life and parenting and ministry, but what I loved in particular about The Life-Giving Home is the way that you and your daughter, Sarah, who you co-wrote the book with, you really describe this idea of homemaking and ministering beauty and rest and stimulating conversation in the home and celebrating relationship in the home, you describe that really as a a way to glorify and honor God. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I think uh, as I look back on my own life, I I had never changed the diaper. I had never, um, I never even thought about marriage that much. I mean, I, I wanted to be in love and have romance. But when I uh, entered into this whole realm of getting married, having children, uh, friendship, community, things like that, I, I began to realize that God was a relational God, and God was a God who threw the stars into place and made the garden beautiful and dimensional and colorful. And so I began to see that a part of me reflecting His image to the world was to engage in everything beautiful, intellectual, uh, spiritual, uh, fun, feasting, um, you know, that that the more I developed as a person and then offered it in my place to other people, the more I would be living out a life of, of the purpose I was created to have and and to really help other people to understand him better by the way that they were served through friendship and home and community and color. And so it was, it, it became a part of my expression of worship and of life. Now, does the perfect home have to have a certain amount of acreage? Does it have to have a two car garage? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's providential. I have moved um, 22 times, uh, eight times internationally. I've lived in tiny places, big places um, all over the world. And so, I began to realize that the expression, uh, I think that the, the first thing I would say to all people is that um, I think that love is the oxygen that we breathe that opens our hearts to possibilities. And so I can um, I can express love in a, a one-room flat um, apartment. I can express love uh, in, in the country in, in, in a homestead. Um, no, there's no one way. I, I mean, I think it's it's providential that each of us have different fingerprints, that we have an, a unique DNA, because I think that God said, hmm, I imagine Sally to be, and then he created me different than anyone else has ever been created. And so in the same way, we have freedom and um, agency to reflect our own personality, our own taste, our own color palette, um, our own food in our home in such a way that it's it speaks of who we love and who we are. 
Yeah, and you describe this in the book as well. I thought, you know, going into this book blind and not really prepping of what it was going to be about, I wanted to be fully surprised. I thought, okay, there's going to be tips and tricks. You know, make sure you buy uh, Egyptian thread count sheets. This right. is how you make a perfect pie. This is how you have a perfect garden. And you do have some little tips, things like that. But it was more about this creating a homey feeling with your family and how you can do that no matter what your financial situation is no matter what type of home you live in. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I have two daughters who both attended Oxford at different times and um, they, each of them at different times lived in this tiny old falling apart dorm room. And um, both of them kind of started it and then talked to each other about it. They would have a a book club and um, chocolate and wine gathering every Monday night um, or every Tuesday night, whatever it was. And so they they used their tiny little dorm rooms in this very 200-year-old house uh, to be able to extend friendship and hospitality to those people who they knew. And so it's not a matter of play or of how big or how large. It's really a matter of do you have a heart to be creative, to enjoy life, to serve other people? And then the juices get flowing and you begin to find trinkets and maybe ca- just a candle will make a um, a messy room look better. <laughs> so it's it's it doesn't have to be one way. It doesn't have to always be perfect. Our lives aren't perfect, but it does have to come with the heart of the host who wants to um, celebrate and serve and enjoy the people who are in and under what I call her domain. When people come into your place, you have the opportunity to love them, serve them, inspire them, and be with them. Why would you disagree with someone who says, hey, you know, I'm going to do all of my serving outside of my home. My home is just a place for bare essentials. I shower, I eat, I sleep, I leave. Why do you feel like, no, we need to take more pride in really creating a home and a nest and having that space? Well, even if it was just for me, um, all sorts of research has proven that when a person has a sense of place, a place being um, defined by uh, belonging, comfort, safety, love, relationships, goodness, then they are much more likely to be um, successful. Like children are much more likely to be successful in their educational um, you know, opportunities when they come from a place that serves their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Same with adults. When adults have place to come back to and their rhythms of grace and the ways they do things, the more developed places, the more humane they are in their work, which has really been interesting to me. Research after research after research has proven that place has a lot to do with the emotional stability, the faith, the grounding of adults as well as children. And that's one thing that I really appreciated about the book, Sally, is because my listeners know I'm not married yet and I don't have kids. And of course, there's tons in your book about raising a family and pouring into your children and everything like that. But also your book works for people like me that are just Mm -hmm. on their own and wanting to make my, my, you know, my, I have a one bedroom apartment, but making that a home. So what I wanted to ask you was what are some ways that we can set up our homes to meet? both the emotional and physical needs of ourselves or our families. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to address a little bit of the singleness because um, I was single for many years, lived in many different cities. And um, I, I really think that wherever you are, whoever you are, now is the time to start cultivating the art of life in your home. And um I think I can't even remember the question you asked me now, (laughs) but um, I think that uh, when I look at my own life, I have, I love that you have the teacup in the corner of your screen because something that I learned as a single woman when I was living in Vienna, Austria was to start out my day. I light a candle. I I, um, make a really strong cup of tea. And of course in Austria, I would meet people for tea or coffee because the coffee is the best in the world there. And um, when I would have my rhythms of what I did, when I lit a candle at, at dinner at night, for me, put my music on, I have a little speaker I carry everywhere, even to hotels when I um, travel. And um, I, I call them rhythms of grace. 
And I thought, you know, I am worth rhythms of grace and beauty. Mm. And so um, I realized that the more I treated myself in a humane way and started creating beauty, and um, I would be very intentional about at least once or twice a week having some girlfriends over. Um, you know, it, it started with the the vision that was being cultivated in my heart of place, home, beauty, and rhythms. And um, it kept me stable in the midst of a real unstable lifestyle because <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time traveling and I worked in communist Eastern Europe and different places. And so I needed to have real peace in whatever room I slept in at night. And um, so I think that uh, it, it don't, I always say to my single friends, I work with a lot of single amazing women in Oxford and I say, don't wait for some imaginary time um, th- this is the place and time for you to be able to create a sense of self and beauty and goodness because it's going to help you flourish more. I love that. I love that so much. So you brought up the candles, which was uh, such a fun part of your book, is that Sally's family, no matter if they went on vacation together, whatever, they always packed those candles and they always <laughs> lit them and had them lit for every meal that they had in their home or hotel room or wherever they were. And I love that. So that would be an example of a physical way um, to meet the needs of your families with like an, a material odd object that gave life to your family. So so I, that was what I was asking about. What are some physical and then what are some emotional ways to meet the needs of, of your family? Um, well, we um, I've written so many books, but one of my favorite books that I've written is called um, the, well, actually, do I have it here? The Life-Giving Table. It, it kind of is follows up um, after the Life-Giving Home. But um, I began to realize that, oh, my goodness, we eat how many hundreds of thousands of meals in her lifetime. And I thought if I used that 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever um, as a time to say, okay, we're going to have conversation. Um, And so it's a funny thing, but lighting the candles was kind of almost like, okay, the ceremony is beginning Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we will be friends. And um, so every single night we, um, wherever we were, except of course, obviously not restaurants, but um, we would light the candles, put on music and then my um, my children and all my friends who gather at our tables knew that we wanted to have conversation. We wanted to say, how are you? I, I would train my children. They were very young to learn to ask, to prepare at least two questions that they were going to ask people when they came to our table. And um, and I, I worked for many years as a single woman with um, college students. And so um, we would prepare ahead of time. Um, I think food opens the heart. Um, we all love food. We're all hobbits. And so we would prepare food. We would prepare the place. And we would prepare the time. And um, so those are some examples. Um, well, you, know, you I, talking about asking your kids to prepare questions for guests, I loved that. That is such good advice because so many kids can't even look an adult in the eye. They don't know how to shake hands. They certainly don't know how to ask questions and participate in an adult conversation. And so you talked about, I train my children to not only know how to serve others when they walk into our home, but want to serve others. How did you do that? Well, I, I, you know, do to others what you want them to do to you. So I would say, you know, you are one of the most interesting little boys I've ever met. And I think you have great thoughts. And I think you have good things to say. And I think that whoever comes to our house would love to hear your questions about their life, about what they're doing, because they will feel more comfortable if they know that you're their friend. And so um, I think that a part of all of this is about in ourselves and in the people that we serve and in our children and our whoever. I have a lot of women in my ministry that come to my home. And it's the way that you paint a vision in their own imagination for how they can be a, um, they can be a, an instrument of love or encouragement. You know, I might have said one night, um, you know, so-and-so is coming to our house. They've had a hard year. Can you tell them one thing that you appreciate about them? See if you can notice something different than everybody else does when they talk to them. And so um, a lot of it was, it, it wasn't a rigid, oh, you have to do this sort of thing. It was a, you know, I appreciate how how conversational you are. I appreciate your imaginary thoughts. I appreciate who you are. And you are a person that has so much to give. As a matter of fact, I think that we, we have these 
conferences for many years. We hosted conferences all over the United States and hotels. And so we would uh, say to our children, you're the best book anybody will ever read because you have a beautiful heart and mind and soul. And just think they have children or you know, friends or spouses waiting at home that because you loved them well at the conference, they're going to think maybe I should love my people well. Mm -hmm. And so we painted a self-image into their imagination and the pathways of their brains that they had a story to tell. They had goodness to give. They had love to provide. And so it was a matter of thinking about it ahead of time, putting the imagination in their mind, and then doing it over and over again. And I I went to a little party the other night, and um, it was a a whole bunch of people. And the hosts uh, had two children who were seven and five. And as soon as we walked in the door, they both, they were so cute. They just said, welcome to our party. (laughs) It was, I thought, wow, you know, to have a welcome from a little child who's learning that at five and seven. It was so delightful to me. And then she said, if you'd like, I'll dance for you. Oh, my so, goodness. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was that was planted in their little imagination. And it was so endearing to me to walk into that environment. Well, and you guys did something really special, too, on your front porch when uh, to welcome visitors uh, always or family members coming home after long travels. What was on your porch that was a very special part of your family? Well, we have so many things that we did, um, but we um, we purchased at different times because they would always wear out eventually because we live in real snowy country. But we had a chalkboard that we had up next to our front door. It's still there. And um, we would say, welcome, Joel, or, or we're so thrilled that you're home, you know, or we can't do without you. So we would always turn all the lights on in the house. We would um, always have a plate of some kind of cookies light candles. And um, when they walked in the door, there would either be a sign in the door or they'd be on the chalkboard, their name with a message. We're so happy you're here. And then I would try to leave in their beds, a bottle of water or pieces of chocolate or something that would say, oh, I know I'm home now. This is what we do. This is this is who we are. This is what we do. How did you foster beauty and creativity in your home for your children growing up? Um, I think that um, you, again, you know, talks in Proverbs about a a woman fills her house with all beautiful and good things. And um, I would just think, um, you know, we're supposed to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And so I started uh, thinking about, um, you know, the the heart attaches itself to beautiful things. So um, we have uh, little, I have framed photographs of our favorite moments all over the house. I have um, these beautiful calligraphy um, scriptures. I have um, these quotes. We we are people of words. All of us are authors, <laughs> and so I have quotations that I'll put on tables or um, on you know different places in the bathroom. I have um, book baskets all the way through the house, and some sometimes in the bathroom there are magazine baskets. Well, the book uh, baskets are one of my favorite things because I am a huge reader, and I worry about kids that are not growing up and having this love of literature, but you mastered that with your kids. Your kids, your daughter, Sarah, writes in the book with you how much she appreciated you having these book baskets and this quiet reading time. Could you talk about specifically how you got your kids to love books? Well, um, every, every single day of our lives, um, well, not every single day, but, you know, majority of our days, um, we we ha- we were always reading books together. We were always going through um, storybooks. I always tried to pick the most beautiful and well-written books. And um, I always tried to make it a, a time when they would cuddle on the couch. If they needed, sometimes we would munch, you know, popcorn or, um, or you know, I'd give each of them a piece of fruit and I'd say, no, you know, the only way we can do this is if everybody learns to be quiet. And there were days when, you know, they would say, he touched my toe, you know, and I would go, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. And I'd say, well, I don't care if he touched your toe. No, I'm teasing. Um, but um, so the very first thing we would do after we had devotions um, is, and those were always fun to read too. We would dramatize them, um, but um, we would read uh, 
beautiful books together, beautiful stories. And then um, in the afternoons, and, and another mother gave me this idea, another woman, she said, one of the best things I ever did was to realize I needed my own one woman tea time in the afternoons. So from, you know, you can make it up two to three, two thirty to three thirty, one thirty to three, whatever. She said, we called her, we had quiet time in our house and everybody went to their rooms or to a quiet place. And for 30 minutes to an hour, would read their own books. And so I would make individual book baskets for my children with interesting books, you know, from science, nature, story, adventure. And then I would reward them greatly if they'd read them. (laughs) You know, we would have these little charts and I would say, once you've read this many pages, you know, you can pick out of the gift basket. I would go to the dollar store and get fun gifts um, that they could choose from. Um, but we, we decided that what you want people to love, you have to make as a habit every day. And so, uh, our children never thought of reading as a punishment. Uh, they thought of it as, as something great and wonderful and intriguing. And if we were reading a book that we didn't like, we'd just get another one. You know, there's, there's so many books out there. There's no magical list that you have to say, these are the only books that you can read. Um, and so I, I realized that uh, in order to grow the intellect, we wanted our children's mental muscles to be strong. Um, that was one of the things we did to help them grow. And then, of course, every night at the dinner table, what did you read today? Do you like what that man did? Would you have done that? Do you think you could be a hero in your own story? I didn't like it when this happened. And so we fostered articulation of the stories that they were reading, the things they were thinking and I think that's what um, made them writers. <laughs> we just love to talk. We just love to think. And we just love words. But building it into the habit, the tra- the rhythms of our home meant that we did it day after day after day after day. It has to become a habit or, or a, you know, a daily rhythm in order to really stick. One of the key ingredients to a home is good food. Imagine it, a kitchen table surrounded by the people you love, Christmas music playing in the background, and the smell of something absolutely mouthwateringly delicious. Someone must be cooking with good ranchers' meat, obviously. From holiday parties to birthdays to staying in and cooking on a Saturday night, food is an essential part of our lives, which is why it's so important that it not only tastes amazing, but it's also amazing for you. This is why I have given up the counterfeit, hormone-stuffed meat, if you can even call it that, from the grocery store. And I get all my meat from Good Ranchers because it's hormone and antibiotic-free. It comes from farms and ranches in the heartland of America. I simply go to GoodRanchers.com slash Clark and select the box that sounds yummiest to me. Let's say I'm feeling chicken. Great. I'm going to go with their better-than-organic chicken option because it means the chicken was raised with care in an open space with no added hormones or antibiotics. Plus, the chicken would arrive at my house pre-trimmed, which means it is ready to be cooked, especially if I order it pre-season. Like, this cuts down on so much time. Right now, when you go to Good Ranchers and use code Clark, you will get $35 off any box. It is a great deal for any time of year, especially Christmas, though. The team at Good Ranchers believes that food brings people together, and I agree, and I think Sally Clarkson agrees. So, go to GoodRanchers.com slash Clark Use code Clark to get $35 off any box, cook some dinner at home, and begin to master the art of true homemaking. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Well, and you guys had four kids, right? Mm -hmm. And you and your husband, I love how you describe that, you know, you had to get to know each child's personality. Some of your kids are extroverts. Some of your kids are introverts. Yeah. And you had to pour into them individually, emotionally and spiritually based on their personalities. And you started certain special traditions with each child to give them this like one-on-one time with mom and dad so that they felt special. Could you talk about that, especially for people listening that have lots of children or children with totally different personalities, how you pour into each of those children so they build a close relationship with their parents? Well, I think one thing is when you build what I call a sense of club, (laughs) um, my children all felt like they belonged to each other. We are the Clarksons. We do things together. This is the tea we drink. This is the thing we do. We're their fusses, of course. But um, I also, I am a kind of an out-of-the-box person 
Um, and um, I would get in trouble when I was in school for talking too much and having too many opinions. <laughs> and so I thought, I don't want my children to feel punished for who they are. And so I would keep um, a, a, a Ziploc bag of frozen cookie dough balls in my freezer. And from time to time, I would pop one into the oven and I would, you know, sneak one of the kids. I'd say, this is Joel's time or this is Sarah's time. And I would take him into my room, light a candle, give him a, you know, a, a fun little cookie or treat. And then I would say, tell me how you are. What have you been thinking? And I've noticed this about you. Or would you ever like to do this with mom? And um, so I would do that, uh, you know, not obviously. Sometimes you can do it every week. Sometimes you can't. But I did it as, as a regular thing that I would just steal time here or there. Um, the other obvious way to help children to feel really validated is everyone has a birthday. And so I think our birthday breakfasts were one of the favorite things that our children have mem- have uh, mentioned for many years. But um, we would all have homemade cinnamon rolls. Um, I, I love to make bread. Don't do it as much anymore because we can't eat it all. <laughs> yeah. But, um, anyway, cinnamon rolls, cheesy eggs, uh, you know, it was kind of our traditional thing and something hot and warm tea or coffee or whatever. Uh, even when they were little, they got they had their cambric tea for, for kids. But um, then we would pile on. Everybody had presents that they gave to the kids, even if it was uh, from the dollar store. They would wrap it and put a bow around it. <laughs> and um, so we'd serve them breakfast. You know, they would open just a fun few gifts. This had nothing to do with if they got together with their kid, friends for a birthday party later, but it was our family time. And then at the end of it, everyone in the room would go around and say, you know, I love the way you draw beautiful pictures, or um, you've become my best friend this year, or I love everybody had to say something positive about the child. And, um, you know, you kind of think, well, my children do that. And I, I think I look back and I think because we started it early and every child got to have it on their birthday, um, my children were very serious about this. And then at the end of the time, we would say, now all of us are going to bless you. And then we would all um, go around the, the table and pray a blessing for that child for the next year. And um, so again, it's just what we did. We did it with every child. We did it all the time. But it gave each child a time to be called out for, I appreciate the fact that you are such an organizer or whatever, you know. Um, and I think that putting those memories into their mind um, will speak to them the rest of their lives. You also did something called, I think it was like morning blessings or nighttime blessings. Oh, yeah. What what were those? Well, I mean, I, and you can do this to anybody, an adult or a child or anyone, but um, I, I just thought that you should begin and end days well. And it's not about how you feel. It's about the right thing to do. <laughs> so um, we would always um, put our children to bed at nights and um, say a prayer with them. And we would bless them and say, I'm so thankful you're my precious little boy, or you are so much fun to me. We just felt like we wanted to leave them every night with a sense that they they were loved, they belonged. Um, you know, if there had been uh, fusses that day, we would ask for forgiveness or we would make peace. We just wanted to send them into their sleepy time with a blessing from their parents. Um, and also from each other, we taught them to bless each other. Um, but then in the mornings, just learning um, you know, instead of a child walking in and you go, now don't leave your shoes on the floor. Don't do this. You know, you, we would get down their level, look them in the eyes and say, I'm so grateful you're my child. Or um, uh, your smile made my morning, kiss them on the head, whatever it was, different every day, but just to enter them into the day with a sense that they were precious to us. Well, and I'm sure that made a huge difference for them, too. Imagine waking up every day and somebody starts off with some sort of positive affirmation like that. Just mm -hmm. your point of like, if the first thing you say to your child is like, now you're going to be late, blah, blah, you know, like that already uh, starts right. your day with a sense of anxiety. It's so true. And I think that, you know, we just uh, finished putting out a book called Giving Your Words. And words um, are, they're there for a lifetime. How many times do you hear an adult say, I remember when... You know, my mom always said, you never shut up or you never do whatever. You know, you're you always lazy or whatever. Uh, I think that learning to use our words with strategy and that words um, are kind of a fuel 
to our emotional and spiritual tank. If we if we want our children to believe that God is loving and that He's not harsh and judgmental and works oriented, then we have to model His love, mm. His grace, His words, His affirmation, His patience in such a way that they will have a pattern to believe in the goodness of God when they're teenagers, when they're young adults. Um, and you know, I don't know about you, but many, many of my wonderful friends that I work with and minister to have deep doubts about God, about life, about church, about morality, about this and that and the other, because it's a hard world. But if you have that foundation of memory, of goodness, and of virtue, and of kindness, and the love of God that you felt through the back scratches of your own family, the, um, you know, the serving a cup of tea. Um, you're much more likely to push through in your faith if you have that picture in your mind of, I have felt this in my life, and I can believe that it's a mirror of who God is. One of the most profound passages of your book, which I was like, man, I would read a book by Sally on just this subject alone, was where you describe how displaced people feel today, that we have huge mm-hmm. mega churches where you can attend for years and never talk to your pastor one-on-one. We have uh, friends that we only talk to online. We don't see them in real life, and they don't hold us accountable. We've got a physical home where we go and we grab food on the go and sleep, but really you talk about how we're still, as a society, homeless in a yeah. sense. Um, yeah. You And you wrote, sometimes we are lonely and we do not recognize what has been lost. So what has been lost in your opinion and how do we begin to get it back? Again, you know, it's making it, writing it in your journal, making a commitment, defining what you're going to do. Um, I was, our our way of life is to invite people in um, because we believe that they are lonely. I was reading in a survey recently that said that eight out of 10 um, women who responded to the survey said they didn't feel like they had one friend. That they could talk to, and um, I, you know, I've been opening my home, um, whether it's a big home or a little home. I don't have a perfect home right now in Oxford. Um, I have, I have a couple of Bible studies I teach, and so once a month I have all the women in for a meal, and um, I have to literally stuff these um, fourteen or fifteen women into my kitchen. It's the only place in my house that's big enough for fourteen people to come into, and they gladly squish together. Um, to be there. I, I had invited this one woman. I, I was convicted that I thought, you know, I haven't been so busy. I haven't really been looking at people and thinking of their needs. So there's this barista who for two years had served me the best cheesy egg quesadillas and coffee at this <laughs> little restaurant I went to. And um, so I said, I said, I would just love to get to know you better. Would you ever come over for just a short cup of tea? I said, at least we can make time for that. So she came over. And um, we talked and talked, and I always try to leave somebody with at least one positive, you know, I'm so glad you're here and you served me such great eggs, uh, whatever it was. And um, she said, you know, in my whole life, no one has ever served me a cup of tea. And um, she was in her 30s. And I thought, no one in your whole life has ever had you over and done something like that for you. And so um, it just reminded me that um you know people are it, we we kind of cover and mask our needs because um we don't want to be vulnerable to the wrong people but i think we all long to be invited in by a friend i have a friend actually who is much uh, quite a bit older than me and um for many years she would invite me over she she just was committed to building me up and she would invite me over always had been prepared with tea or coffee a candle lit and come into my home. How are you, my friend? And she got me through so many hard times, not by giving me specific advice, but by loving me and inviting me in. And then I thought, I'm not so alone. I'm not as lonely as I thought. And I I think that, um, you know, Jesus said, you will, people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And that has to be exhibited and exercised, and it has to be planned in to our busy lives. Yeah, you talk about how you believe it is a God-given mandate as Christians for us to open up our homes and serve others. And I'm just, I was thinking about that and how, I mean, hardly anyone, nobody, I don't feel like anyone just invites people over. I never see people anymore like in the neighborhood, you know, inviting people over a big potluck for the neighborhood or 
I, is it a generational thing? I mean, people just don't get together like that anymore. Well, I think that, you know, if you look back on history, I mean, uh, before transportation, before railroad and, and planes and, you know, trains and modes and planes, um, people lived in the same community. They knew their neighbors. They lived in the same house their whole lives. And then when people started being transferred in their jobs all over the world and people started flying places and living places, uh, most people don't even know their neighbors. But um, I don't. My, I know. I mean, I, we kind of do, but not deeply. But um, all of my neighbors have been in my house for a cup of tea. <laughs> uh, my surrounding neighbors right now. But um, okay, my next book, I keep hating, hating to say about all these things, but my next book is very specifically about how to mentor people by extending invitations to your home. Because I think that as believers, we need to be the most loving people that people ever meet. And even if it takes up 30 minutes, I only met with this woman for 30 minutes. I said, I have 30 minutes. Let's talk and be friends during this time. Um, And that was the most special thing in the world to her. And I think that we can't really have the heart of Christ unless we are moved to do the things that Christ did, which was to be a servant leader. Think of how many meals he made. He made the fried fish on the beach. He um, did the Passover meal. He fed 5,000. You know, he uh, he cared. Uh, he made us people who love food, and then he served food. And um, it's a way to open up friendship with people who are longing to be known and to be seen. Well, the majority of the life-giving home you break down in the book each month of the year and different mm-hmm. activities based on that month that you can do with your family or different traditions you can start, which I really, really liked. And since mm-hmm. we're in the holiday season, speaking of inviting people into your home and how to serve others, could you talk about how, uh, could you talk about the tradition that your family always did for New Year's Eve? Well, we did two things. Uh, during December, um, we invited everybody who knew how to play an instrument and their friends and family, and everybody brought food, um, heavy hors d'oeuvres, cookies, um, cakes, whatever. And we would fill our house sometimes with 50 to 100 people. And then for New Year's, we would do it smaller. And we would invite um, one or two families, um, or each of the children could invite one of their, you know, some of their friends or a family um, that was the parents of their friends. And um, chili con queso was always... And, and chips was always a part of our tradition. And um, we always had certain cookies that we made or certain um, treats. Sometimes we would make sticky toffee pudding because it feeds a lot of people and it's oh so delicious. It's so wonderful if you've never had it um, with a with cream on it or with it. It's just wonderful. But um, yeah, we just, we wanted for our kids to look at the different holidays as a time when um, we we never lived near family. Um, and so that's why we tried to extend our hospitality to people wherever we lived because uh, we didn't have the opportunity of having family into our home on holidays. So we I, we didn't want to just have one more day that was like every other day with just the Clarksons. So that's why we would invite families into our home on these special holidays. Well, yeah, you guys moved way more than the average family, cross-country, internationally, like you talked about. How in the world can a family maintain order in the home during a move? And then when you do have to move, how do you recreate that hominess that you had in the previous place? Um, You know, it's a funny thing. People ask me that, and uh, and my husband and I are both pretty systematic in some ways, but um, we would just do the very same thing we did at the last house at the next house. Um, you know, it always set up the the dining table first and put our dishes in place. And we would set up the kids' bedrooms, you know, and um, we every house had its own personality, but every house held the same family pictures, calligraphy, um, book baskets. You know, it was pretty easy um, to be able to um, set up the things the same way because we did them in such a specific way. And um, moving, oh my goodness, it does get so tiresome. I just moved recently and um, because our flat was being sold in in Oxford and um, to someone else. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. But we literally jumped in and in a day and a half, we had our house back and we just threw the boxes that we hadn't unpacked into the attic, (laughs) thinking we will get to those. If we need them, we'll know they're up in the attic. But I think it's just... um, you know, I think living a good life, it's like anything, takes a lot of work. Mm. And um, 
all of our kids learned how to jump in and do their part. And it, we just, I don't look at that part as being hard because once we established our rhythms and traditions and things that we loved, we threw the books up on the shelves, we took, put the book baskets out, we put the pictures up, and everybody kind of just helped and it, it got done. You talk about how your children now that they're all adults are your best friends and how much that means to you because you didn't have a lot of extended family around. Now that you are older and your children have all grown up and left the house, could you share with us advice on how to pour into our children so that when they're older, they'll be inclined to pour into us? You know, I, um, I've always, I mean, in the past few years, I've, one child has always lived with us. You know, they're between things, they're getting their PhDs, they're doing this, they're moving country. Um, and, um, I think that if you can look at each child, um, especially as, as kids grow older, um, as a real human being, and they have their own desires, their own appetites for life, their own opinions and respect what they want and not require them to to be your cookie cutter person. Um, I I feel like the more we love people as they are, affirm them for who they are, enjoy them for what they have to give, um, then we are a safe person for each other. We can tell each other our warts, our fears, our doubts. We can um, tell each other our dreams. We can affirm the celebrations. Um, I think it's just basically general principles of friendship that will create the kinds of relationships that people need, no matter who it is, if it's a, a friend, a coworker, a, a, a child, a husband, it's that basic respect. And I will love you for who you are. And I will try to understand your context, even though it's a little bit different than mine. What are some ways that we can make sure that our homes begin the journey for our kids towards Christ? Uh, again, it's it's that daily, daily, daily. Um, I think that we we would say, oh, you can't imagine what I learned this morning. What do you think about this? We came to scripture not as a duty, but as um, as an amazing um, communication from God. But then I think introducing our children, we're we're all kind of walkers. <laughs> we have a golden retriever. We went walking yesterday. Um we we would take our children out um, you know, with us pretty daily on a walk, on a family walk. That that got me out of the house with my quibbling children sometimes. But um we would say, I wonder what mood God was in when he created Dalmatians. And he said, I'm gonna put <laughs> spots on these dogs or, you know, uh we love um taking our kids out to look at the stars. And the the galaxies and the constellations and saying, can you imagine what God is like if he threw those stars into place and angels were singing and celebrating when they saw them come into life? Or, um, you know, he would say, God is the God who knew that I would need my um, golden retriever. And so we connected our children intellectually, spiritually. We knew that if they needed to know their whole lives, that God loved them no matter what that we needed to give them words of love, touch of love, um, you know, rhythms of love, the rhythms of blessing at night. And so I think that understanding that Jesus was a person who gave his whole life. He served. He washed 120 dirty men toes, um, you know, the night that he was going to um, be crucified. And um, so we just tried to take his love and stories into our lives in such a way that we could exhibit them through the moments of our days. Why do you believe, last question, it is godly and an honor as women to take charge in managing and organizing our homes? I think it's one of my favorite things. I didn't know how much I would enjoy it. Um, I love working. I love my profession. I love all the things I get to do. But um it, it's so much fun for me to be able, it's been a great pleasure for me to realize that I'm kind of like the conductor of an orchestra, that I get to conduct the music in my home of what life is going to be. And um, I believe that God created us with a capacity to be creative. I've, I've, said, I've had so many people say to me, oh, I'm just not the creative type. And I think you may not be the creative type like 
another person's personality. But if you are made in the image of God and he's creative, then you have the ability to co-create. You know, if God um, created rainbows and grass and and beauty and and food, then, um, you know, maybe, maybe you are, you know, could do a garden, maybe you could do whatever. But I do believe that it's a lost fulfillment. It, it's not a duty. It's something that um, of all the things I've done, creating a life-giving home and enjoying the people inside my home, I never knew how close a family could be. I never knew how much I would love um, the belongingness that we had. I never knew how much I would love the traditions and rhythms. And um, so I believe that uh, we all have different callings, different stories, but I do think that um, being made, uh, you know, they say that women's brains are just amazing and they have this capacity for all sorts of connections um, that men's brains don't have. <laughs> and and so I feel like uh, women are natural civilizers. Um, they're, they're people who have great capacity to think and to communicate. And so I feel like my home was the first domain in which I could exercise many of those things. And then from the richness of my home is what I would go into the world with to to use in other places. The book we are talking about is The Life-Giving Home by Sally and her daughter, Sarah Clarkson. Miss Sally, besides The Life-Giving Home, what other books of yours do you recommend for young women or for parents? (laughs) Well, um, I'm just about to get to put out there my 28th book. So um, I recommend them all. They're all great. They're 28. The <laughs> but um, I, I, I just think, you know, depending on where you are, um, one of my books, Own Your Life, is about being very intentional and purposeful about um, living a life that matters, living a life where you have used your capacity, where you've used your um, ability to choose and make something of the story that you've been given. We all have different stories. Your story becomes your platform for what you do in life. Um, I love um, all the life-giving books, life-giving home, life-giving table, life-giving parent. Um, For those who are struggling or or feel depressed, I have a book called Dancing with My Father. Um, I have another book called Help, I'm Drowning. Um, And then Giving Your Words is the one we just had, but I'm really excited about my next book, because it's exactly about what we've been talking about, hospitality, friendship, learning how to reach out. And it's it's called Tea Time Discipleship, and it has all sorts of tea in it. And I of course, love that. <laughs> you and I both love tea. So anyway, I, I hate to be the one who says that, but I would always have friends in mind when I wrote a book. And I, I hope that you know they'll just be a resource for people. Thank you so much, Sally, for coming on the the spillover. It has been such an honor. You are truly, you don't know it, but a hero to me and a mentor. And I enjoy your book so much. Oh, thank you so, so, so much. And I I just loved being with you today. We could have a great cup of tea together, I'm sure. I had three more pages of questions I could have gone through with you, but (laughs) neither of us have time for that. But I could talk to you forever. So I'd love to have you back and maybe we could talk about your new book sometime in the new year. That'd be really fun. Well, I love what you do. You're, uh, it's just been a delight to be with you today. This conversation reminded me of Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Inviting people into our home. We're offering them things as simple as a cup of tea or some homemade cookies just for 30 minutes of conversation. Just seeing that somebody's struggling and being like, hey, I would love for you to come over. I'd love to make you a cup of tea like Sally talked about. And just through that that hospitality, people will be able to taste and see literally, but also spiritually, that the Lord is good. And in the book, The Life-Giving Home, one thing that I wrote down that Sally had said was, if we want our children to grow up loving what is true, what is beautiful, what is good, then our homes should reflect that wholeness, right? And just so oh, there's so many things that I I didn't get get to get into with her with which some of that was about homeschooling some of that was um, just about you know young women today feeling the weight of raising godly children in a world that is so completely devoid of God she covers all of that in the life giving home um, and then obviously she's got what twenty 
27, 28 other books or whatever that she talked about that goes into this even more. So you will find so much wisdom in her books. And I also really, really love looking to older women who can be mentors, who can impart wisdom on us as young women who are starting our families or even in seasons of singleness like me. Um, Just that type of that type of, um, I guess, ministering and stuff is so, I feel like, undervalued in our culture. And I feel like it's so disrespectful as us of young women to kind of be like, oh, you know, you're older, you don't know anything. Like, no, go to those women who have been there, done that, lived those lives. They've gone through every single tragedy and, you know, amazing thing that you could imagine in your life, all the ups and downs. And so to go to those women and be like, how did you do this? What do you think about this? I love getting advice from them. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this episode for Christmas. I really wanted Sally Clarkson to be the guest for the week of Christmas. Um, Next week, next week is crazy. So this week was really uplifting and like a feel good episode, right? Next week is going to be kind of like the end of the world is coming, which is great, right? For the new year, going into the new year and World War III is just around the corner. Well, that's kind of what we're getting into with our guest who is going to be talking about a very deep, very philosophical uh, discussion about things like gender theory and what we can figure out about the future of our country based on the history of our country. It's really going to be an episode for the intellectuals uh, and kind of like a scary on your edge of your seat episode. So The Spillover is back next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, anywhere you get your podcasts. Make sure that you are tuning in before the world ends in 2023. Just kidding. But also, I may not be. Um, And also, you always have the option to watch the episodes on the Politics YouTube channel. So I am Alex Clark. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. This is The Spillover. And I love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye.